I'm here with James Grind. He was originally identified just as James in the New York Times, and he is an abuse victim of ex-Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. This is a heroic moment for James to come out and to tell his story and also reveal a lot of things that we never knew about ex-Theodore Cardinal McCarrick. You talked about your your childhood being stolen from you. When did that happen? It started when I was uh, 11 years old. Um, McCarrick came to the house. McCarrick was a very prominent part of my life, a uh, very prominent part of my whole family's life. He had been part of the family since uh, 1950, hmm. um, or probably in the 40, probably 48 when he met my uncle, my mother's younger brother at Fordham uh, University, and they did everything together. And my grandfather uh, adopted him basically because he had no father. And so he became the very fabric of the family. My grandfather was from St. Gallen, Switzerland. He was a uh, person I just want, who. I just want to pause uh, here. I just want to pause here. St. Gallen. Yeah, St. Gallen. Important. Very, very important. Very, very important because. Uh, um, the connection is was started back in the forties. He was he went to there. He went to St. Gallen to meet my grandfather's work friends and his holy friends and his uh, anybody that you know. St. Gallen is not a very large city, and my grandfather knew everybody. And so that he introduced McCarrick to everybody. Uh, and in fact, he went there on a regular basis, on a yearly basis, probably for 20 years. And he has a, uh, you know, a maturity with many friends there. The idea is that uh, the, the door was opened for him in St. Gallen, probably in I will say when he went to for a language school in 1951, my uh, my aunt explained to me he came back from uh, from that trip and his whole life had changed completely. It seemed that he took that language school and ran it. It was uh, in a uh, a monastery, and uh, his whole life changed. And that's when he changed from being a, trying to be a parish priest and just being a uh, a regular to becoming a uh, somebody who wanted to ri rise up into the Catholic Church and into the hierarchy. His whole life changed, and he used my grandfather to uh, introduce him to Spellman and then Cook. Now this is really key that. It begins in St. Gallen, and we know that there was a St. Gallen Mafia, and this, this really goes into the 90s, but before that, there's this connection with McCarrick and St. Gallen. Do you, see, do you see that there's a organic connection between McCarrick's work in the 50s? And then later on, with the conspiracy, they say, to remove Benedict the 16th? Yes. I've known this, and I've felt this for a long, long time. And when you, uh, when you gentlemen started to talk about it and uh, listening to your, iPod, uh, your podcast a while ago, back in, in August, I just connected my dots with yours and said, praise God, somebody's starting to talk about this. It is so important because this is where it all starts. What is the St. Gallen Mafia or the St. Gallen Club? And what is their alleged role in the election of Pope Francis? Back with me today is Timothy Gordon. He is the author of Catholic Republic. He's done a lot of videos in the last several weeks. And he's back again here to talk about this controversy of the St. Gallen Mafia. Many of you, as you've read around, you've heard it referred to, and this is not necessarily conspiracy. This is something 
um, that members of the St. Gallen group have talked about themselves. So we're here to talk about it, identify who's a part of it, and to help us is Timothy Gordon. So Timothy, welcome back. Thanks a lot. Glad to be here again. So the revelation that there is this group, they themselves jokingly refer to themselves as a mafia, the St. Gallen group. How do we know about the existence of this group in the Catholic Church of these high-level cardinals and bishops who work together and coordinate? The two primary ways are, one, through the um, papal biographer, uh, Austin, is it Ivory or Ivory? Some people say Ivory. Um, who's a, a, a wild um, Pope Francis enthusiast, which is um, which is good because this gives us a, a, a very reliable means of of taking him at his word that this will be either flattering or at the very least factual. The other primary means that we know about the the Gallen Saint Gallen group is through uh, another close uh, friend and supporter, uh, Cardinal Gottfried Daniels. In his biography, which came out right before the 2014 Synod, his autobiography, Dr. Marshall, um, yeah, he, he talks about lots and lots of corroborating facts as they appeared in Austin Ivory's uh, biography of Francis. van St. Gallen, dat is een soort naam, didaftes. Maar eigenlijk zeiden wij van onszelf en van die groep de maffia. Kardinaal Daniels praat voor het eerst over de geheime groep van kerkleiders waar hij toe behoorde. Hij doet dat in de basiliek van Koekelberg, waar zijn biografie wordt voorgesteld. Vanaf 1996 kwam die groep elk jaar bijeen en organiseerde ze in het geheim het verzet tegen Jozef Raatsinger, die op dat moment de rechterhand van paus Johannes Paulus II was. En daar waren enkele bischoppen bij, een paar kardinalen, te veel om op te noemen, maar waar heel vrij uitgesproken werd, er werd niks verslag van gemaakt, waar dat men, dat, dat waar dat men zich eens kon uitleven. Wanneer paus Johannes Paulus II sterft in 2005, schuift de groep al de huidige paus naar voren als zijn opvolger. Maar het wordt toch raadsinger. Daniels kan zijn ontgoocheling nauwelijks verbergen. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Als je weet hoe de pudding smaakt, dan moet je wachten tot hem eet. Maar het duurt niet lang voor de groep van St. Gallen een nieuwe kans krijgt. Want paus Benedictus treedt onverwacht af. In 2013 heeft deze groep eigenlijk wel haar streven bereikt, namelijk met de keuze van paus Franciscus. En in zekere zin kun je dus zeggen dat door deelname aan die groep de kardinaal toch wel een van degenen is geweest die de voortrekkers zijn geweest van de keuze van paus Franciscus. Kardinaal Daniel staat dan ook te stralen naast paus Franciscus op het balkon in Rome. Sindsdien gaat hij regelmatig naar daar om te praten met de paus. Volgende maand is hij opnieuw uitgenodigd om deel te nemen aan de synode over het gezin. In my parish in Texas... There's an elderly Swiss woman, and she says that when she, she was near St. Gallen, and as a younger woman, she remembers that the, there was rumors of the clergy being corrupted in St. Gallen, and that in the 80s, and especially in the 90s, they brought Freemasons in to the college there where McCarrick was studying. And, and basically de-Catholicized the Catholic university there. Exactly. And that's, uh, that's where uh, your mafia has started. And that's where uh, all the plans had been laid to bring Francis into uh, the, uh, the papacy. As we Catholics are trying to understand, why did Benedict XVI resign? How do we have predator priests 
all the way up with red hats on their head. This song Gollum piece is starting to break open, and I think you're onto something, James. And I, I want to explore it a little bit more. He was a priest. He baptized you. Did he then go to St. Gallen or was that, how does it fit into the time frame? He went to St. Gallen before, uh, first off, before he was even a priest. He went to St. Gallen the first time when he was in either high school or last year of high school. No, I believe it was uh, Fordham University. And so sure. that, uh, that's when my uncle Werner and he were best friends. And that's when my grandfather basically adopted him and said, you can do anything you want to. And your grandfather was in Switzerland. Well, my father, my grandfather is hundred percent Swiss and he's, he had his first shop in St. Gallen. My grandfather uh, invented the bra and girdle. Okay. <laughs> so great contribution to the world. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was obviously a man of means. If you invent the bra and girdle, he had it's successful, means. obviously. Yes. He had the means. So, so Theodore Carrot comes to St. Gallen to study. Your uncle, who's Swiss, is studying there? Yes. They, they become good together. buddies. They're buddies. And then they are introduced to your grandfather, who's a man of means. And he says, hey, I'm sponsoring you for your life. I like you, kid, Theodore McCarrick. You can be anything you want to be. So he was bankrolled from the beginning. Bankrolled from the beginning. And this, people, everybody watching this, this is the origin of the St. Gallen Mafia. It has to be. Yes, that's true. It has to be. It has to be. Unbelievable. There's providence in this, James. The Holy Spirit is at work. We are, we are, scratching the surface of something really big and terrible here. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. You know, if, if you had not, so he's, if you had not explained to me what Vigano had said and about the money laundering and all that other stuff, these thoughts never would have come back to my head. Why did Pope Benedict XVI resign the papacy on February 28th, 2013? This has been a big mystery for most of us, but we now have many more clues in the resignation of Pope Ben XVI because of the testimony of Archbishop Vigano. Vigano was at ground zero when the Vatican Bank scandal broke out in 2010, 2011. This led to the Vatilink scandal and more scandals culminating in this 300 page dossier that was presented to Pope Ben XVI months before he resigned. And so Vigano has really opened this up and his role in this recent testimony isn't new. It actually goes back into his days with Bennett XVI in 2010 with this scandal at the Vatican Bank. So let's look at what the Vatican Bank is. Now the Vatican Bank is officially known as the IOR, Institute for Works of Religion. IOR stands for the Latin Institutum Pro Auporibus Religionis. That's the Institute of Works of Religion. Now, in newspapers and in news, they call it the Vatican Bank. I'm going to use the term Vatican Bank and IOR interchangeably. They refer to the same institute. Now, the IOR was founded in 1942 by Pope Pius XII. So it's a new institute. It's recent, within the last 100 years. And what's interesting about the IOR is it's not the property of the Holy See. It remains outside the jurisdiction of the prefecture for the economic affairs of the Holy See. This makes it independent, and therefore, many people have conspiracies about what it is and how it works. Now, the IOR is governed by a commission of five cardinals and a lay board of superintendents. Now, let's look at the scandal of the IOR, the Vatican Bank, going back to the year 2009. In 2009, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, the same Vigano who released the 11-page document accusing cardinals and, yes, even Pope Francis himself, in 2009, he was appointed by Pope Benedict to the Secretary General of the Vatican City Governorate. This elevated Vigano to be the second-ranked Vatican administrator to Pope Benedict XVI, second to the Secretary of State. 
Now, from 2009 to 2010, under Vigano's leadership, the Vatican City went from a 10.5 million negative deficit to a 44 million positive surplus under Vigano's supervision. How did that happen? Was Vigano really good at the stock market? No. It seems that this $54 million swing into the black, into the positive, was in fact not great investing, but the consolidating of hidden funds. Hidden funds that were being used all over the place in Vatican City without oversight, off the books, not audited, not being accounted. And so it seems that Vigano and those with him consolidated all of these accounts and put them into one place to be seen. And so suddenly, the Vatican City went from a negative 10.5 million deficit to a $44 million surplus. $54 million, the equivalent of U.S. dollars, suddenly appeared in the Vatican checking account. Now, not surprisingly, in September of 2010, that same year, the Italian government seized 23 million euros from the Vatican Bank, from the IOR, and alleged that there was money laundering conspiracy going on with the IOR. It fell under the anti-money laundering laws of Italy. About six months after the money was seized, on March 27, 2011, Archbishop Vigano, the same Vigano, addressed a letter to Pope Benedict XVI describing the financial corruption in the Vatican Bank, the IOR. Then, a few months later, on May 8, 2011, Archbishop Vigano addressed a second letter, this time to the Cardinal Secretary of the State, again, describing financial corruption in the Vatican Bank. Now, just a few weeks later, Rome's Attorney General released the 23 million euros, those assets, back into the Vatican Bank. So, the charges of money laundering were dismissed or taken care of somehow. A few months after that, on August 13th, 2011, Pope Benedict XVI removes Vigano from within the Secretariat of State and instead appoints him as papal nuncio to the United States of America, where he will live in Washington, D.C., next to Cardinal McCarrick and Cardinal Wuerl. Now, Reuters reported that Vigano was unwilling to take this assignment, but Benedict XVI insisted, and so Vigano said yes. Why did Pope Benedict do this? Well, it seems that Pope Benedict knew that he could trust him to go and make an honest investigation into the alleged corruption of the infamous Cardinal McCarrick. We now know that because of the 11-page testimony that Vigano released. Again, now with this new document, if it's true, these stray ends are coming together and being wrapped up. After Archbishop Vigano was sent to Washington, D.C., some hierarchs in Vatican City issued a statement against him. And here's what it said. Quote, The unauthorized publication of two letters by Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, the first address of the Holy Father on March 27, 2011, the second to the Cardinal Secretary of State on May 8th, for the Governorate of Vatican City is a source of great bitterness. The allegations contained in them cannot but lead to the impression that the government of Vatican City, instead of being an instrument of responsible government, is an unreliable entity at the mercy of dark forces. After careful examination of the contents of the two letters, the president of the government sees it as its duty to publicly declare that those assertions are the result of erroneous assessments or fears based on unsubstantiated evidence, even openly contradicted by the main characters invoked as witnesses, end quote. So, these cardinals and secretaries of the Vatican State issued this statement directly against Vigano, and they call Vigano a liar. So, was Vigano a liar? Was there corruption at the IOR, the Vatican Bank, or was there not? Well, just a few months after this happened, in May 2012, a journalist, Gianluigi Nuzzi, published a book called His Holiness, The Secret Papers of Pope Benedict XVI. This is the controversy known as Vatalinks. 
or it's like WikiLeaks, but it's the Vatican, the Vatilinks scandal. And this book included letters by none other than Archbishop Vigano. Just a few days later, on May 23rd, 2012, the Pope's butler, Paolo Gabriele, was arrested by Vatican police, not Italian police, but by the police force of Vatican City itself. And the next day he was charged. And on the very next day, May 24th, 2012, the head of the Vatican Bank was fired. So they arrested the butler, and then the next day they fired the head of the Vatican Bank. That head or president of the Vatican Bank was Ettore Goti Tadashi. And the reason given was, quote, failure to provide any formal explanation for the dissemination of documents last known to be in the president's possession. A couple months later, August 13, 2012, Pope Benedict's butler Paolo Gabrielli was indicted by Vatican magistrates for aggravated theft. On October 6, the butler Paolo Gabrielli was found guilty of theft and was sentenced to a reduced sentence of 18 months inside the Vatican. And usually these punishments are not in a dungeon in the Vatican. They're living in Vatican City under house arrest. And on December 22nd, 2012, interestingly enough, Pope Benedict XVI pardoned his butler, Paolo Gabriele. So Paolo the butler receives papal pardon. Now, while all of this is going on, the Vatilinks, Pope Benedict XVI is unnerved and he commissions an investigation. He chooses three of his most trusted cardinals to do an investigation on the irregularities of the Vatican Bank and to find out who these people are. And these three cardinals were Cardinal Horans. He's a Spanish cardinal. He's a member of Opus Dei, and he served as the chair of this investigation committee. Also, Cardinal Joseph Tomko. He's Slovak, and he's by ritual. He serves in the Roman Rite and the Eastern Churches, I think the Byzantine uh, jurisdiction, but I'm not quite sure on that. And then also Salvatore de Giorgi, who's an Italian. These three men did a secret investigation for Pope Benedict XVI. They prepared a 300-page dossier inside of a red binder and presented it to Pope Benedict XVI on December 17th, 2012. This red binder with 300 pages in it documented financial corruption, but also deep moral corruption, allegedly describing Vatican hierarchs and cardinals dressed in drag with lewd details about them given by Roman male prostitutes. And so at this point, it becomes clear to Pope Benedict that the financial irregularities are also related to moral irregularities related to homosexuality inside the walls of Vatican City. By the way, December 17th, the day he receives this red binder dossier and reads it, is the day reportedly that Pope Benedict XVI realized, I am not up for this challenge, I'm going to resign. Just to make a connection, the binder was given on December 17th, 2012. It was on December 22nd, five days later, that Pope Benedict pardoned his butler, Paolo. And this has led some, including myself, to wonder, perhaps the leak was on purpose. Why would the butler do all this if he's a very close friend to Ratzinger Benedict and then go through the whole process of a trial and then get pardoned within days of this binder by Benedict XVI? It's a little unclear, but something's going on there as well. Now, just a couple weeks after he receives the binder and reportedly decides to resign, pressure is placed upon him. On January 1st, 2013, the ATM machines inside Vatican City, these are the machines that people who work there use to get cash, to get money, they cease to work. And all the Vatican bank accounts are reportedly closed, so much so that the Sistine Chapel, the Vatican Museums, can only accept cash because the systems are down. On February 11th, so a month and 11 days later, Pope Benedict XVI announces publicly that he is going to resign the papacy. The very next day, on February 12th, 2013, a Swiss company called the Aduno Group, 
takes over the operation of the Vatican ATM cash machine. And by doing so, circumvents the Italian and EU regulatory pressures. On February 28th, Pope Benedict officially resigned the papacy and we entered into an interregnum. On March 13th, 2013, Pope Francis was elected by the College of Cardinals. What's interesting is just a few months after the election of Pope Francis, in June 2013, the money laundering case against the ex-head of the Vatican Bank, Goto Tedeschi, was dropped. And around the same time, Pope Francis appointed Monsignor Battista Mario Salvatore Rica as the interim head for the Vatican Bank. So why did Pope Benedict XVI resign? Well, going back to 2009, 2010, there's a shakeup in the Holy See with the Vatican Bank. And who is right there in the middle at the bullseye? Vigano. Vigano is the one that's shaking things up and it leads to secular intervention and an accusation of money laundering. The head of the Vatican Bank ends up getting fired. Vigano ends up being pulled out of the Secretary of State and sent over to the United States of America. But $54 million have come into the Vatican Bank, and there's a lot of questions. And the Vatilinx begins to break that open. And that, in turn, leads to Benedict discovering the moral rot of sexual deviancy within the walls of the Vatican. Something he may have suspected or not, but becomes clear when those three cardinals present the 300-page binder onto his desk. So really, it was a four-punch knockout. First off, Vigano blows the whistle on alleged money laundering. Two, the accusation of money laundering leads to the Vatilinx scandal. Three, the Vatilinx scandal leads Benedict to form a secret investigation with three cardinals. And then four, those three cardinals expose moral rot, sexual deviancy, that's been paired up with financial irregularity. This is what moves the Pope to resignation. And just to make sure there's enough pressure on him to actually do it and to do it quick, something funny goes on with the Vatican banks beginning on January 1st, 2013. And it seems that the powerful cardinals, the powerful hierarchs within Vatican City wanted it to happen fast because they don't want the contents of that 300-page dossier released to the public because there is moral scandal in those pages. Now, that binder was left for the successor of Benedict, who is Pope Francis, but nothing has been done. And what we've seen in the years to follow is that those who were opposed to Benedict XVI, theologically, but also on administration, have been reinstalled, reinstated, and promoted. Vigano says, that Benedict XVI put sanctions on Cardinal McCarrick in Washington, D.C., and that Pope Francis reversed them. If that's the case, we can see that within the walls of Vatican City, not just cardinals working secretly, but Pope Francis himself has been undermining the investigation that was prompted by Vigano as far back as 2010. So where do we stand now? Well, we have this 11-page document that Vigano has released to the public. And it connects the dots morally. He doesn't go into the financial. A lot of that stuff is already out in the public, though no one knows about it. But if you, if you go back into the Vatilink story, you're going to see Vigano is all over it. Could Vigano be lying? He could be. And if so, all this falls apart. It could just be that he's been a troublemaker from the very beginning. But if he's telling the truth, and other Vatican officials and other cardinals come forward and attest to what Vigano has been telling us, then this pontificate of Pope Francis is in big, big trouble. He studies in St. Gallen. He gets associated with your family and their wealth. And then he decides to be a priest? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And that uh, it was, yes. And my grandfather would go back to St. Gallen every single year for probably 15 years. 
and he always went. Sometimes with Who's my he? uncle. McCarrick? McCarrick. McCarrick, yes. McCarrick would always go. And if you go back to listen to what McCarrick said about he was he was approached by some very significant people that he knew and that needed him to uh, bring up uh, uh, Francis. And uh, oh, yeah. let's, let's, let's politicize this. About maybe just before we went into the general conversations when everybody can talk. Very interesting and influential Italian gentleman came to ask if he'd come to see me. So I said, sure, and he came to see me at the seminary, the American college where I was staying. We sat down. This is a very brilliant man, very influential man in Rome. Uh, and he, we talked about a number of things. He had a favor to ask me for back here in the United States. But then he said, what about Bergoglio? And I was surprised at the, at the question. I said, what about him? He said, does he have a chance? I said, I don't think so, because no one's mentioned his name. I, he, hasn't, he hasn't been in, the, in, the, in his mind. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's on anybody's mind to vote for him. He said, he could do it, you know. I said, what could he do? He said, he could reform the church. He gave him five years, he could put us back on target. In the video where he, he says a prominent Italian gentleman suggested to him Bergoglio, who could this be? Is this, is this Italian gentleman a cleric? Politician? I'm, I'm scratching my head on this. I don't think it was Italian. I think it was Swiss. He just ah. covered it. I so see. that you couldn't connect the dots. Gotcha. Or it would be, if it was an Italian gentleman, then it was definitely a politician. But he says, so, uh, uh, you know, an influential man. Did he know? Well, he, you know, he may even pass a note. If you don't do this, uh, you know, you're, you're out. Right. These people are very, very powerful. Uh, the, the agenda of the United States has been, had been uh, for many years for, uh, you know, changing the climate changing uh opening up our borders and letting a mass migration come through. socializing Socialize. public Social services medicine everything. everything the united states is the most powerful country in the world and if they can get the united states to do that then they can come forward and take over the entire world with communistic agenda and be in power that's what I believe that they had have in mind for themselves. And that's what they want to go forward with. But they haven't been able to do it because what Bella Dodd said is that because of the patriotism and because of uh, the belief in Jesus Christ. It's amazing. It, and just the connection with your family in St. Gallen is so important. And I bet in months to come, years to come, this is going to begin to unravel. We're going to see what happened there with the Cardinal Daniels and Martini and Casper and Lehman and Basil Hume in London and Cormac Murphy O'Connor. All of these St. Gallen guys were McCarrick friends. Yes. And money. Money. Lots of money. Lots and lots of money. Why is this named after Saint Saint Gollum? So, so it's a it's a it's a place, right? Um, yeah. that, that where they would meet regularly in Switzerland. This, this group, yeah, where they would meet in in Switzerland, and um, more or less the, the Saint Gollum group. I, I I think it's just for lack of a more creative name, but you know the 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 ordinary there. Um, um, was Fuhrer, yeah. Fuhrer, yeah, yeah, Fuhrer, invited starting in 1996, this group of cardinals who were staunch, you know, not, not including, not including uh, Bergoglio at all um, at that time, Archbishop Bergoglio, to meet and to discuss, again, on record, this is not just an allegation, it's, it's as admitted by, by um, some of the parties there, some of the cardinals, to discuss how to avoid the inevitable 
um, eventuality of a Ratzinger papacy. Um, yes. But yeah, so so the name is nothing more and than this just began where, where as, they met. In my research, this began in 1995. Do you agree with that? The first meeting was in Switzerland. I've, I've seen both 95 and 96, but okay. but yeah, it's it one of those years. Yeah, yeah. I'm and they're here, seeing at this 95. point the decline of John Paul II. And right. they're discussing what they believe is the best outcome for the Catholic Church globally. And who would be the best pope according to their agenda. Right. And they all agree that Ratzinger is the wrong guy. He represents what they don't want. And so these meetings begin in 95, 96 in St. Gallen, Switzerland. And who's there? I mean, who are we talking about? Let's get some big names rolled out here. So, well, the, 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 the big three, I think, by anyone's estimations, are not, not the ordinary there in, in St. Gallen. But, but, but he was as, there. He was there. He's the host. The, yeah, yeah well, the, the triumvirate is this guy we'd mentioned before, um, Cardinal Daniels um, from Brussels, um, um, Cardinal Carlo Martini, who we have to really spend some time on. He's, he's very important by anyone's standards. And then Cardinal Casper, who everyone, depending on their level of exposure to Catholic commentariat, we talked a lot about in 2014 and 2015 under the synods. Um, and yeah, then, then there's, there's a list of sort of, um, you know, rotating members that weren't there necessarily every year. But those were the guys running the show. And really, really, um, Cardinal Martini was, as, as you said earlier, uh, Dr. Marshall, the Don. Yeah. That's hard to hard to avoid that designation. So do you want to, you want to start with Cardinal Martini? What yes. would you say to the person watching? They've never heard of Cardinal Martini. He's the Archbishop of Milan. Um, he was Arch there in Milan from 1980 to 2002. Um, he yes. died in 2012. But theologically, who is Cardinal Martini? Theologically, now this is this is less less deniable or less symbolic in, uh, than what we talked about last time with regard to the the sort of mentorship, the distant mentorship between um, um, Juan Peron and the Pope. Cardinal Martini really was a, a veritable, actual, proximate mentor to um, young Archbishop Bergoglio. Um, so that's really, really important. Just to to state that at the outset, you know, this is this is someone that knew him, that interacted with him, that really that really believed. In, at least before he died, he died in 2012, by the way. So he he never lived to see a Bergoglio pontificate. Yeah, but he dies right before. Right before. Um, and so that's not, again, this is not proof positive that, that the, the eventual Bergoglio papacy is precisely what he wanted to see. The, you know, the evidence can be judged on its own merits, but he, yeah, he wanted, he thought Bergoglio was the guy for, uh, the St. Gallen Mafia, which is, which is, um, at least not strange, but it's it's surprising considering that that young uh, Jorge Bergoglio was so and we just, unknown. For those that yeah. don't know, we have a lot of new people watching. Archbishop Cardinal Bergoglio is Pope Francis. Boom. We yeah. assume that some people don't haven't made those connections yet, but Bergoglio is the future Pope Francis. Yes. So so you know, Cardinal Martini was not only the sort of mentor figure. Um, He's old, you know. He 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 died in 2012, uh, reflecting, you know, he was he was well into his 80s, and he was a notorious dissenter from the late 60s from Humanae Vitae. He was one of the prime dissenters from Humanae Vitae, and there there were several, but he was one of the ones that managed to make his name among you know decently informed lay as one of the prime dissenters to Humanae Vitae, which was of course. Pope Paul VI's affirmation of timeless Catholic teaching on contraception, very, very unpopular with certain radicals in the church. And and Cardinal Martini counts himself in that number. You, you can't not. The, the uh, Humanae Vitae dissenters are kind of, they were arguably the beating core of St. Gallen before it was even a thing in 95, yeah. 96. And, and Martini's on record saying that Humanae Vitae did major damage. Right, to the major church. damage. Major, to that's the his church. quote, major damage. And, and what's interesting is, is 
you know, we, we look back on the, the John Paul two years, and the Benedict years, and there wasn't Twitter, there wasn't Facebook, but all along, so we never heard these things, but all along Martini was very open and public about his rejection of Humanae Vitae. This shocks people, but right. Martini was open and vocal, just like many of the, the bishops in Germany were, um, out, outright rejection of Humanae Vitae. Right. Outright, as outright as his rejection of Humanae Vitae was his support uh, going the other way was this outright robust and strong for what he called criticism of a tired church, a what he called a pompous church. And he affirmed what he wanted to see as a young church. These are direct quotes. Um, so he was one of the ones from the 70s that that was um, fiery in its opposition to really the history of the church. That, that's what people have to understand is before the late 19, before the late 1800s, you didn't have a college of Cardinals that were opponents of the church qua the Catholic church, right? They were supposed to be the greatest sons of the church, the supporters of it. Um, her history, her, her beautiful patrimony, her beautiful, you know, um, um, sacra sacramental distillation. So, he Cardinal Martini is most associated with the assumption, and this is something that, that's really important to, to me personally, dealing with young people. He assumed that young people will always, always oppose chastity, the virtue of chastity. And he was one of these cardinals that spoke as if it was a, a precept that, he, you know, chastity is something that the faith will hate, that the, that the census fidelium can never fully accept which is which is you know wrong and and to, to effectuate his open rebellion against humanae vitae um, he wanted to focus on synodalism or synods which are you know giving the, the bishops more power than they'd ever had under the council structure so well, you know one of the things about martini that struck me is you know we've heard this phrase from pope francis about you know being the surprises of the Holy Spirit, being open to the surprise of the Holy Spirit, and it was later pointed out to me that this language, this, this term, actually comes from Martini. Yeah, that yeah, that's, that in the yeah. history in the history of the Church, in particular our time, which Martini calls a prophetic time, there will be surprises of the Holy Spirit, which right. you know we could be apologists and say, well, that just means you know renewal. But in these circles related to the St. Gallo Mafia, it seems to mean radical changes in dogma, in doctrine. Right. To be right. open to these surprises of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, when you, look, when you have a magisterial faith like ours, meaning, meaning tradition matters, not just scripture, um, and, and the magisterium aids very explicitly in how to interpret the sign of the times, to borrow St. Paul's term, that what really, really matters is the governing structure of how to do these interpretations. So when you talk about the surprises of the Holy Spirit, the term allegedly from, from Cardinal Martini comes out of like the wisdom books of the Bible. I think it's like Job or something like that. Well, you know, you know, sometimes in salvation history, particularly with regard to the Jews, they were surprised. I mean, heck, yeah. There's there's some there's there's limited validity to this if you've taken the right way. Jesus surprised the Jews that he was a more spiritual Messiah, not a not a political one. So it becomes difficult to discern whether or not this is hot political rhetoric, you know, or or whether or not there's there's validity to um, the imposition of surprises of the spirit. One one way to one immediate response that any faithful son of the church ought to have is that, well, it makes more sense that the spirit would surprise a, a, a Jew prior to the coming of the Messiah before he set up, he established at Pentecost that these apostles were to become bishops, right? And, and, and with a governing structure of the bishops, we're not supposed to have the same kind of willy-nilly surprises in, in, yes. in doctrine yeah, we're and not, structure. We're not seeing a, there's no new covenant or new new covenant or newer covenant. Um, what we are taught as Catholics is Christ and the apostles laid down the deposit of faith, the, the tradition. It is unchanging. It is perennial. 
and it will remain that way until Christ returns. Like, you know, there is no other New Age coming, Age of Aquarius. There's no Book of Mormon coming out. There, are, yeah. there are none of those surprises are going to happen. And and you'll hear renegades in the church that want to take down Humanae Vitae and other such teachings, timeless teachings of the church, make reference to developments of doctrine, which yeah. are valid, right? Doctrine did develop, even even sacramental doctrine developed for the first um you know, 800 years of the church, uh, when we talk about matrimony. But but there was nothing there when it's a legitimate development of doctrine. This is really, really, really important. When there's a legitimate development of doctrine, which can happen, there's nothing in tension with what has always been taught by tradition, right? right. So it shouldn't be that surprising. I mean, when you when you formalize, when you sacramentalize matrimony in whatever that was around 800 A.D., it wasn't going from saying, you know, we like Pepsi to we love Coke, right? which is yeah. if you take Pepsi and Coke to be opposites, which I don't really care. I don't drink either. But the point is, it you shouldn't be going from one opposite to another. You should be going from something that was maybe less emphasized mm -hmm. in the tradition of the church to something now that is, is dogmatically declared or doctrinally right. assumed. Yeah, like in, in 1215, Fourth Lateran Council, they codify the word transubstantiation. Right. Yeah, there were some some people, some heretics who didn't like that, but it didn't contradict anything in the previous tradition. Right, and it, it went along with it. Not only did exactly. it exactly, it just clarified it. It, it clarified it. And humanae so, vitae, and again, for people who are watching, like, what's humanae vitae again? Humanae vitae is the encyclical of Pope Pi, uh, Paul the Sixth, who which states that, among other things, abortion, adultery, whatnot, that contraception is inherently evil. And, and the sign of the times, these radicals in the church thought they, they'd just gotten communion in the hand by a kind of bit of, of, of subterfuge, then it, it would, we call it right. hollow out at law, yeah. an exception that's going to be hollowed out. There was the new liturgy imposed, so a lot of progress was happening, in the, a right. lot of surprises of the Holy Spirit were happening, and then all of right. a sudden, boom, Paul VI drops a doctrinal note on contraception, they, they, which is they, a yeah. direct hit on the agenda of sexual liberation. Right. And they thought they had some mo. They thought they had some serious momentum going. And then uh, Paul the sixth, uh, praise be the Lord, you know, the Lord is good, said no. He held the line. There's this, I think it's Cardinal uh, Odie, uh, a hardcore Thomistic Dominican, wrote part two of of uh, Humanae Vitae and just completely held the line and, and shocked all of these radicals. Radicals like Martini, who, yes, I didn't know this until recently either, um, is the one that directly bequeathed um, young Archbishop Bergoglio with the idea of surprises of the Spirit. Whether, whether or not they're using them in the exact uh, same way, right. can, you know, people can uh, judge for themselves. But, he, yeah, he got this turn of phrase exactly from it. And the idea of a young church and the idea of, of a synodalism. Let's talk about the Belgian cardinal, Godfrey Daniels. Yeah, so he's he, it's it's uh, Colonel Daniels biography, which came out right before the 2014 Synod, um, week before, where he proudly, proudly, uh, unabashedly exclaimed a number of things that I think were later taken out. Uh, a quick, quick second edition of the biography was made um, about you know about the St. Gallen Mafia itself. And it, it seems almost as if w when the St. Gallen Mafia had been meeting from, from 95, 96 until 2006, the year after the conclave which elected Benedict, it seems that they somehow, um, this comes directly from Cardinal Daniels, they had still, even though they didn't meet after 2006, had a, a means of exercising uh, influence coming up to the 20, 2013 conclave which ended up electing Bergoglio uh, Pope Francis you know when when Pope Francis was elected and he appeared on the loggia to give his first blessing as Pope and his first opening next to him is Cardinal Daniels now Daniels yeah you only get to only so many men fit on the loggia of St. Peter's it's big but you only get so many and so Francis gets to pick his posse right right the men he's grateful for 
and he right. brings out, I'm going to put a picture on the screen right now so everybody can see it. There's Pope Francis. He's on the Loggia St. Peter. This is when he was elected Pope. And right there is Cardinal Daniels. There's also a great picture of him with, uh, of Cardinal Daniels, not, not with Francis, but by himself wearing all kinds of colored, um, um, non-canonically supportable uh, garb during, during Mass. There have been lots of allegations of his connection, of strong allegations of his connection to Freemasonry. There is the undeniable fact of um, um, he had been on the record on a recording um, advising a the victim of sexual abuse not to turn turn in evidence against his abuser, who happened to be his uncle, uh, the victim's uncle, a clergyman. And also, well, there's, there's this long rap sheet that, that Daniil said. Also, he, I think, openly brags that he convinced the king of Belgium to make abortion legal. Yes. I mean, re- really, really, really startling stuff that most of this is an admission. I, I, I might be confusing. You know, I, I don't think the admission was the recording of him urging the young boy not to, to turn evidence, but except all the other stuff was an admission by the cardinal himself. It's, it's troubling stuff. What does it mean? for? He's also the, an, a huge advocate of liberation theology. Right. Oh, uh, all of these guys. Yes. Well, not Casper, but I, I, uh, Martini was, I believe, yeah, most of these are, are liberation theology and, guys. And he's also openly um, advocated for civil recognition of same-sex unions. Yes. So on all the yeah. issues, you know, oh, and also he's, he's kind of light on euthanasia. So on all these like hot topic issues... He's on the wrong side, you know, of of all of it, you know. And I think right. this is indicative of what the Saint Gallen group, mafia, whatever you want to call them, um, what their agenda is. And it's it's you know, like you mentioned earlier, it's related to the sixth commandment: "Thou shalt not commit adultery." There's this idea that we can be Christians, we can be faithful to Christ, and our sexual sins don't matter. Right, as, and it goes back to this Riley Lutheran idea that we're justified by faith alone; that right. the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to our souls, and that our works and our actions don't matter because our faith grounds us in Christ, and that justifies us and that saves us. So it's Lutheran theology. You know, you get right. Rahner and you get other you know nineteenth century theologians who call it the fundamental option. What they really mean is faith alone. Um, and so Luther's theology is now being, not baptized, but receiving confirmation in the Catholic Church. And this is why in, in 2017, we saw a Lutheran statue, you know, in right. the Vatican. We saw a stamp, stamp. of yeah. Martin Luther, yeah, basically looking yeah. like a holy card. Right. This Lutheran idea that we can be justified by faith alone without works and that our sexual sins do not put our salvation in jeopardy, is ultimately the theology at the bottom of the St. Gallen group. Right. Right, yeah. And they're using different language, different words to have surprises of the Holy Spirit. This is an old surprise. It's 500 years old. It's Martin Luther. And, um, you know, if you all, it just look into Walter Casper, Cardinal Casper. Look what he's saying. Look what Daniels is saying. Um, Look what Martini's saying. That's the theological agenda.